Turn over your Bibles to uh, uh, Romans chapter 12. And uh, last week, we began thinking about healthy church, what it looks like. Uh, we asked the question, what makes a healthy church? Uh, how can we continue to build and be a healthy church here at New Testament Christian Church? And Paul's words in Romans chapter 12 kind of give us a couple of examples of essential elements for the church. Uh, number one, we talked about last week, everybody has to do their part or the church can't be healthy. It's just like the parts of the body. If we're not doing everything we can for ourselves uh, and for those around us, we can't be healthy. We're not taking care of ourselves. And, and then this week, this morning and next week, we'll talk about how the healthy church is a church where everyone acts in love. And the things that we do, the way that we serve one another, the way we treat each other, we're going to see. Uh, one main thought today, as we look into uh, Romans chapter 12, we'll pick up in verses uh, 9 through 16. And, and that is that a healthy church is a place where uh, we are known for our love. Uh, not simply say that I love you, but uh, it's like marriages, isn't it? Or relationships. Somebody can say, well, you know I love you. But if we never demonstrate that love, if we're not known for the way that we treat one another in our relationships, you can say, well, I sure don't feel loved, even though we say we, 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 we love each other. And so John chapter 13, verse 35, Jesus says these words, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And so when he was asked what the greatest commandment is, just what Jesus says, that we're to love God and we're to love people. And in this verse this morning, as we look at this passage, uh, Paul's going to show us this snapshot of what it looks like when we show love to our brothers and sisters in the church. And as we read through uh, this passage of Scripture, uh, we're going to see what John Stott calls a recipe for love. Now, anything that uh, is worth cooking up, you normally want to have all the ingredients to make it what it should be, right? Uh, and so today, Paul gives us 10 various ingredients, and we're not going to preach a great big long sermon on it. You'll be out of here before 12 o'clock, most likely. Uh, but I want to give you those 10 things, just little snapshots of them as we go through uh, and, and kind of verify what these are. First of all, if we see in Romans chapter 12, verse 9, he says, Love must be sincere, and that we are to hate what is evil and cling to what is good. And so the first thing we need, what? Is a sincere love. It means nothing to simply say it. It means to be deep down in our heart. In the original language, uh, the word translated as hypocrisy was, was used to describe actors just wearing a mask. Maybe you've experienced that in your life. Maybe you've experienced it in your relationships. Maybe you've experienced it even in the church, as, as, as difficult as, as that would be for us. And people who just try to hide who they truly are and, and how they truly feel, and they just wear this mask. And true Christians love that agape love that, that we often hear about in scriptures. Uh, cannot be masked. You put it on before you even come through the church door on Sunday, don't you? You just come in here because you love God. You love his people. Uh, Jack Cottrell writes in his commentary on Romans that this love does not deepen, uh, uh, depend upon some uncontrollable inner emotional desire or, or need for fulfillment within the one who loves, but rather it is a deliberately willed attitude of concern and goodwill based on the needs of the one who is loved. We can be really good at hiding how uh, we feel about somebody, I'm smiling, uh, saying something like, bless their heart, you know. It's amazing. We really want to put a blessing on it and say, oh, bless your heart. But in today's society, somehow we have made it like, oh, look at them. Poor wretched soul. Bless their heart. You know, it's almost like it's a criticism or a condemnation of some sorts. And, but we, we really need to understand that love is a good thing. And it's, and, and it's not simply just how you feel. It's something that you decide that you're going to do. The second thing that we see is that he... He's listed here uh, that our perception of good and evil in verse 9. He says we're to hate evil and love good. Uh, that's a difficult thing in the world today. And I think the old King James, maybe even the New American Standard, would use the word abhor. 
uh, you know, ab abhor evil and cling to what is good. And so what does that leave us with? It, it leaves us with no option of walking down the middle of the road when it comes to uh, making moral decisions. We have to make those who are based on the word of God. We, we have to say, what does God desire? What does he want for me? And, and how can I live this way? Well, the way we have to do that, we, we have to understand that love hates evil. It doesn't embrace it. Now, I know what you're going to say. Well, Jesus hung around with prostitutes and sinners and tax collectors. He loved people. He didn't love their lifestyle. You know, he, he, he knew who they could become. And so he spent time with them. He did not say, well, you just got, you guys and girls just keep on. Ladies, uh, I, I just wish you well tonight in your work and your, in your experiences and whatever else you're going to be doing out there on the streets. I pray that you're going to be safe. Uh, no, that's not what he said, is it? When he would meet somebody, uh, as they understood who he was, he says, uh, go and sin no more. I love you. And he spent time with them. But then he didn't send them back out to keep living the same life over and over and over again. So let me ask you, do you hate evil? Uh, do you really hate evil? Or do you only hate the evil that you feel like doesn't line up with your life? I, would, I don't mind this, but I would never do that. And maybe somebody sitting right beside you would say, well, I don't mind this, but I would never do that. You, you see, but if they're both considered evil in the eyes of God, what do we do? How do we change that? That's what he's going to get at. You know, when's the last time that you were alone watching TV and something came on and just made you cringe and disgust and that you just had to change the channel? You know, we say, well, I don't like them gory movies. Uh, I don't watch horror flicks and terror stuff, and some people love that, and I don't watch none of that kind of stuff. Well, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when nobody else is in the room and somebody's taking their clothes off. And you know that God has said this is something that should be between a man and a woman in, their, in the privacy of their own bedroom. And, and then yet you're experiencing and you're taking it. So, well, I'd never let my kids watch it, Dan. That's not what God's saying, is it? You know, there's evil in the world, and that's the way we get things into our life. Uh, if we're going to truly love God and we're going to love others, we have to hate evil. By We have to repel it. We have to reject it in any way we can. Instead, we have to cling to what is good. That's the only way it's going to happen. Always looking for good. Uh, that's what Paul would tell us in Philippians chapter 4, isn't it? Uh, finally, brothers, whatever is good, whatever is noble, whatever is pure, whatever is holy. And he goes on and on and on. And he says, you think about these things. Well, if I'm only thinking about those things, it tells me I don't have time to think about and allow these other things in my life. And plus, thinking about those things reveals what these other things are when I encounter them. That's not good. That's not holy. That's not righteous. You, you understand what he's getting at? We have to search out the good and be a part of it. And if we love one another, then we will encourage each other to cling to what is good and flee from evil in their lives. Romans chapter 10, uh, 12 verse 10 says, Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. So that's the third thing we find is a family devotion. We love to say the church is a family. Everything's a family anymore, don't it? My work family. Uh, my travel family, my church family, my so-and-so family. We just go on, everybody's family. And it can have that element, don't get me wrong. If you do the same things, have a commonality with somebody. But are we a family? You know, when Paul says to be devoted with one another in brotherly love, he uses two separate terms which uh, connected the idea of love found in a family. Uh, he first uses this, Fill a storage or be devoted. That's the word that's used. Uh, this is a combination of two words. Kind of refers to this innate and tender love that a mother might have for her children. That's the first kind. And that's the type of devotion, he says, that we should have for one another. But the second term is the one where we get our word Philadelphia from. That brotherly love. Uh, the church is a family. The local church here at New Testament Christian Church, uh, Christian church we are a family. And, and we have many siblings that aren't here this morning for one reason or another. All have been born again. They've been baptized into Christ. Uh, they're our brothers and sisters, but we, they're not here today for whatever reason. Maybe they thought the weather was going to be worse than what it is. 
Uh, maybe they've had other work commitments. Uh, maybe they're traveling. We, we just don't know. Uh, my wife's taking care of nursing uh, people back to health uh, this weekend and probably into the next week sometime. Uh, we realize we've all got different kinds of circumstances and situations, but then there are those others. Our brothers and sisters who only show up in our own families for the family reunion. You know what I'm talking about. They're only going to be there when uh, uh, it's time to open, you know, take the lid off the pot or open the presents, or whatever the case is. We just, they're only going to be there for the big events. Why is that? Now, it could be, obviously, on their end. You know, that's all they feel like they need to stay connected to the family. Or it could be we've simply not said, hey, look, you know, we've missed you, brother. We've missed you, sister. Uh, we didn't recognize a need in their life, and we weren't devoted to a meeting those needs in their life along the way. We, we never know why that is. Sometimes brothers and sisters in the family just don't get along. I used to fight with my uh, brother, and for whatever reason, he was just a knothead. And I still think he's a knothead, you know? And that's going to happen, but I still love him. I look forward to the times I get to see him. I try to call him probably at least once every three or four weeks if I don't hear from him. Uh, but we just sometimes didn't get along. And even today, we don't always see eye to eye. I'm older now, and he respects me as the uh, elder statesman, maybe, of the family. But we don't always agree. We've got different viewpoints on things, and it could be something as simple as how to change the spark plugs on a 350 Chevrolet motor. You know? He's got his way of doing it, and I would have mine. Sometimes we don't always agree. But, but you know, we have to love each other, and we have to watch out for each other. And that's the way the church is. In the church, that means we're going to love those in our church, but it also is going to mean that we might be in the church or, don't, uh, or, or part of something else outside. Maybe it's the people with family in the denominations or maybe our brothers and sisters in a denomination that we're not as comfortable with, but we say, well, we're going to love them and call them our brothers and sisters in Christ. So Paul tells us that we should also uh, give preference to one another. Here's what he says, that we should honor others above ourselves. You know, we have to be willing to do that. In other words, put others ahead of ourselves. That's difficult sometimes for us, isn't it? I mean, I find myself that way. I, I've got my own schedule, my own things, and then uh, I, I need to stop. And, and it seems like sometimes my family suffers for, before anybody else does. As the minister of a church, you know, you say, well, where are you going to be? Can you do so and so? Well, I can't. I've got to run by and see this person, or I'm going to be meeting somebody in my office, or I'm going to, you know, we've got a funeral coming up, or, you know, and, and vacations get changed, uh, you know, days get cut off that you were going to be, because, you know, something comes up, and it even spills over the other way at times. There are times where you just say, okay, I can't be a part of that because I need this family time, or I've already committed to this person, and I can't commit to that one. We understand those kind of things, but we need to be willing to say it's not because of my, I have a desire to serve myself, but it's just I, we can't be all things, all men, every place at all times, you know. And so we must be willing to be humble and selfless. Don't try to be the first one in the line in the fellowship hall for the meal, you know. I mean, everybody, somebody's got to go first. Don't get me wrong. But, but if you're the person who... You know, go ahead and pray, preacher, and you're standing in the line with your plate and your fork and your everything, and you've already started dipping, and you're like, okay, he's praying now, better stop. You know, and you're always the same person doing that, and then you're probably not the type of person that's trying to elevate other people above yourself. My previous congregation, we had an elder there. For whatever reason, he was always going to go in, and they'd come on across because the fellowship hall was across the street, and, and he would go ahead in, and he and his wife said, we're just going to get our food because there might not be some left when what we want. And, and, and they'd go and get their stuff. You know, be sitting down for everybody even got across the, tree, the, the, the street. They've already got their plates, of it, entire plates made, sitting in, in front of them. And, and the, everything they're going to want. And they're just like sitting there with their, you know, knife and fork in both hands. Like, okay, let's get on with it. It's time to do some eating and some, you know. And, and so I talked to our leadership one day I was in, in a meeting. I said, you know, I'd love to see us uh, not be in the, we want to set the example in leading. Don't get me wrong. But I don't think the buffet table is the place we want to do it. You, you know what I'm saying? 
we want to set the example. We want to be the first in our love and our charity and our giving and, and, and teaching and wisdom and, and, you know, sharing of the word of God and leading people to Jesus. But I don't think in those aspects, in the selfless aspect, that's not where we want to be leading. You know, when people start telling me when I was to been there six months and they said, well, we got to wait for the elders because they go first. I said, well, we're leading wrong. You know, we're leading wrong. And then he says, we need to be willing to honor others above ourselves. He says, verse 11, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. So that's the fifth ingredient we run into, isn't it? It's the excitement to serve God, to serve the Lord. We want to, I just got to go do it. My favorite thing for Sundays is to be able to come to church and be able to preach. Some of my least favorite things is to sit in my office for hours on end. What am I going to be preaching? What have I got to read this week? What have I got to do so and so? You, you know? But I do all that for what? To do this. Because I want to be with you and, and, and I want to have this excitement about it. I, I'm not a good singer. I love to hear those guys sing. I love to hear our choir sing. I love anybody who wants to. I love to hear the congregation sing. I'm just not a good singer. And if you said, hey, look, you're going to come to church every Sunday. You don't have to worry about speaking. You don't have to do anything else. Just sit there and sing. I probably, a lot of time, I would sing along a little bit, but I'd probably spend more time listening. Because that would not be my motivation. Because I know that's not my gift, but I try to do better at it. And you tell me, you're not as bad as you once were, kind of thing. And I take it as a compliment, because I'm terrible. I know I'm terrible. So what does an excitement to serve the Lord look like? What does it mean to never be lacking in zeal? Or better yet, as the New American Standard may put it, lag behind in diligence. It means that you, you know, you're not the type of person going to sit there and huff and puff and hesitate because you don't want to do something. You know, oh, great, I've got to go teach those kids today. I didn't know I had this class, or I didn't know I had to do a Sunday school, or I didn't know I had to, I got this my Sunday to do it. Oh, me. We've all been there, haven't we? We've all been there. And yet, he says you need to have an excitement to serve the Lord. One commentator writes that Paul's warning against that attitude which seeks to get by with as little work and inconvenience as possible, which shrinks from dust and heat and resents the necessity for any exertion as a burden and imposition. You know? It's just oh, something else I've got to do. When it comes to hard work and serving in the church and loving your brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, don't be slow and resistant. Be excited. Fervent in spirit is what the scriptures would say. That's the picture of this pot of water getting ready to boil and, and, and it's bubbling over at the top. It's just, it's just, it's just brimming over. You, do you know people that way? It seems like they're just all happy and cheerful. And sometimes you're just like, why are they all so always happy and cheerful and bubbly? Today's not the day for me. I want to be happy, cheerful, and bubbly, but God's going to put them in your path. You know why? Because you're going, oh, today ain't the day for me to be happy, cheerful, and bubbly. But sometimes about being around people like that, you can't help but be more like that, can you? It just rubs off. And you become more fervent in spirit yourself. It will affect those who are serving around you. It will also affect the people in this world who are watching to see how you respond to Jesus in your own life. You see, the world is not going to be moved by a bunch of Christians who kind of halfway served the Lord on Sunday at 11 o'clock in the morning and maybe hit and miss in the community for some type of fundraiser or pitching in and helping with some type of social cause or whatever and then go on with their life the rest of the time. No, they want to see people who seem to be on fire for God on a regular basis. Then he says, be joyful in hope. In verse 12, patient in affliction and faithful in prayer. So when, when I read this verse, it gives this idea uh, that we should have this dedicated focus on Jesus. And if I'm joyful in hope, where's my hope come from? Well, Paul would write that we're waiting on the, the blessed hope, that being Jesus. 
if I'm patient in affliction, who am I depending on in my difficulties that I'm dealing with in life? I'm praying to God and I'm asking Him. But I'm faithful in my prayers in all things, not simply in the good times. When, when, when everything is going great in my life, I rejoice in the, the hope that, I, that I've got Jesus and I just praise Him for all the good stuff that's going on in my life. But when, when my world starts falling apart and times get tough, maybe you can sympathize with me a little bit here. Maybe you've been through it too. I, I, I had to persevere in my prayers to Christ to get me through that and say, God, help me to see the other side of this. This past week, Amy went for her endoscopy. Not a pleasant experience, but it's not the most difficult thing to have to endure in life. A number of years ago, she'd had one where she was having some issues. And when they went in, they've noticed some scarring from some previous, uh, maybe some ulcer issues or something like that. She actually had an active ulcer. Well, Amy had been having all this problem over the last several months, and the doctor had put her on a medication. And after two or three weeks of taking this medication, uh, she began to have symptoms. And as we began to look at the symptoms from the medication, we realized maybe it could be this medication. But we went to, she went to her doctor. They said, no, we think it's your gallbladder. We think it's this. And went to the hospital, had all these tests run. That doctor immediately says, no. If you've been off that medicine for two weeks, that you shouldn't be having these problems now. That would probably be already out of your system. You're, you're, it's probably going to be this. It's probably going to be that. So we run thousands of dollars worth of tests. Right? And so in waiting for this endoscopy to come about and Rocky Mount, we begin to pray. God, she said, I feel good. I don't think I even need to have it done. I really believe, and the new doctor she's seeing says, I believe it was the medication you were on. I do believe I'm one of those after looking up all the, uh, the side effects that it was going to lead back to that. But go ahead and have your endoscopy just so we'll have something on record that, you know, testing and everything. So she went. So we prayed, God, we're going to have tests done anyway. Let it be so that you just use it as confirmation for answered prayer. Right? Sometimes God's going to let us go through stuff. Sometimes he's going to let us be there for one another. So we begin to pray that way. When they did her endoscopy, they gave her the pictures. Everything was just as clear. No scarring, no ulcers. That's the stuff we were praying about before. See, God used this time and this episode with what she dealt with to give us confirmation of answered prayer from another time and what she was dealing with. You know, sometimes he's going to do that. And so what we do, we rejoice because we're not ever going to be completely immune to any type of difficulties in life. Then he says, verse seven, uh, in verse 13, he talks about being generous. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Paul uses a form of the word uh, kononia. In, in, in the verse, it, it, it means to share with others. It's the idea that we would sh share more than simply our pocketbook. We, many people say, well, I don't go to church because it seems like I'm going to take up an offering. We have a young man that attends, or a little bit older probably, but he attends church periodically here. And uh, he said that he liked coming to our church because we only passed the offering plate one time. Where he goes, they pass it multiple times. He said he just thought it was odd because he's so used to the offering plate being passed several times. He said that's one reason he liked coming here. <laughs> he only passed it one time. I said, well, if that's a motivation to come to church, we'll, we'll take it for right now. But, but it's, this idea here of what Paul's talking about is more than simply, you know, monetary, though that's going to be a part of it. Many times it's just easier, I think, for us, isn't it, to, and cleaner along the way just to open our wallet, uh, take out a few bucks and hand it over to somebody and say, I did my spiritual part here. I've tried to be a blessing. And we are. But if we're simply doing it to pass off the opportunity to be a better blessing or serve in a different capacity, maybe we're not doing everything God called us to do. You know, maybe you say, well, I, I, I hate to see people suffer, so I'm going to write a check to the Benevolence Fund. That's great. Keep doing it. But what if somebody said, I need a ride to the doctor? You can't refer back to the check you wrote a month ago to the Benevolence Fund and say, well, I do my part. I write a check to the Benevolence Fund at the church every, every month, and uh, you're going to get a ride somewhere else. Because maybe God is telling you to be generous with your time and the resources you have in a different area as well. You know, he talks about 
being hospitable. And sometimes I think what happens is, is we don't want to get in the messy aspect of people's lives, you know. And sometimes getting in the area of people's need in their life gets just that, messy. One commentator writes, we are, we are to identify ourselves with the needs of the saints and make them our own. Sometimes I don't want to make them my own. I don't know about you, I'm just being honest. Because some of the struggles people get are self-inflicted. But others are not. But I have to say, even the self-inflicted aspect, okay, how can we get you through this where you don't keep making these same mistakes over and over and over again? It's going to take some time and teaching, isn't it? Not simply just pulling out a few bucks out of my wallet and say, here, this will help you get your groceries this week, or, or, or this, will, I, you know, this may help pay your utility bill, or whatever the case is. Well, how, what, do you, what can be changed lifestyle-wise? How can we help you? How can we be praying along the lines to help you not keep going down this road? That's part of being generous as well, isn't it? It's investing more than just your money in those who have a need. It's your time. It's your, your prayers. It's your skills. Maybe somebody just needs their oil changed. You could do that if you had the opportunity or the ability. It's investing your emotions, and that's where sometimes we cut off, don't we? We don't like, I don't want to get emotionally attached. Paul also gives us a direct application for how we're to contribute to the needs of the saints by showing hospitality. Hospitality is this spiritual gift that, that, that some are more gifted with than others. Matter of fact, that's one of the gifts of leadership in the church. Must be, what, given to hospitality. Now, you may be welcoming people in your home, but as much as anything, it's about welcoming them into the family of God. It's about sharing and ministering wherever we can. And so hospitality is a spiritual gift, and, and, and we need to be willing to exercise it like we would anything else. Well, then we get the, the eighth ingredient here, and that is that we have this unnatural response to persecution. You know, there's a Christian comedian named Jeff Allen, and uh, he, he, he was talking about his kids and he, you know, most kid, comedians and preachers are going to talk about their family because that's what we know the most about. But he said his son was, uh, you know, he wanted certain things as he's growing up and he's going through puberty and all this kind of stuff. And they think they're grown, they're big as you are, but they're still got a kind of an immature mindset about things. And he was getting on his son about something. And he said, he's, he's walking along, his son said, what are you persecuting me for, man? What are you persecuting me for? His dad's just telling him, pick up your room, do so-and-so. You know, he saw that as persecution. But there's going to be times we're going to go through difficulty. People are not going to treat us right, Paul says. Look at verse 14. He says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Now, let's be clear. If you follow Jesus, you're going to face some form of persecution at some point in your life. Uh, we don't always know what it's going to look like or when it's going to come, but it's going to show up because you're a follower of Jesus. And Jesus says, if they hate me, they're going to hate you. And if they persecute me, they're going to persecute you because they're trying to get to me. And since you are his child... You want to make somebody get upset, you know? You let a mom or a dad that uh, has children uh, be somewhere, and somebody's just, you always got this type of person who just wants to get under your skin, kind of rile you up a little bit, or feel like they want to take a jab at you. But you're like, Scripture tells me, as much as it depends on me, as we'll learn later on in Romans, they don't really live at peace with all people, and I'm just not going to let it get the best of me, you know? So all they got to do is turn that thing when they realize they're not going to get you and they say, your child did this or that or the other or I don't like you or, the, or you know, all now we're going to claws come out, don't they? You, you see what I'm getting at? Somebody somewhere along the way is not always going to be acting Christian. Larry the cable guy, he would tell something about somebody and demean them or talk about somebody. Then he says, but I mean that in a good Christian way. Boy, when we're demeaning people and when we're tearing them down, there's no good Christian way about it, is it? Now, there's one thing Jesus talks about sharing the truth and love, but we know when I've had the truth shared with me, uh, and it's been in love even when I, it's a, a rod of correction in my life from the Lord, I may not always like it, but I understood it was shared in love. And so I'm going to respond with like kindness. And the closer you grow to Christ, the harder the enemy is going to try to attack you in some way or another. 
And the stronger the church grows to Christ, the, I think the fiercer the enemy tries to attack it. You know, you think about it, when Jesus went in to teach, and the first person he encounters is the greeter at the door, basically. And he says, what are you doing here, Jesus? You come to destroy us? And Jesus says, you hold you. You keep your mouth shut. Now's not my time. That's a person everybody else has been around. Day in, day out, as they come in to hear the teachings. They hadn't recognized that. But this one had, because he had an evil spirit in his life. And you see, it's going to happen, no matter where we are, even in the church. And I think when something happens to us, and persecution comes, the natural response is to hit somebody in the nose and curse them and, and to ask God to do bad things to them. So you want me to pray for you? I'll pray for my enemies, all right. But Paul tells us to fight the natural urge and, and, and with something that's unnatural, and that's prayer and to just lift them up and bless them even when we don't feel like it. And to ask God to do something good in this person's life, uh, life, God, so that they know that I'm following you, and first of all, that you're going to get glory for all of it. Maybe they'll be drawn to it. You remember Joseph's story, don't you? Over in Genesis, when you're reading about Joseph, uh, who, whose brother sold him into slavery down in Egypt, he had spent 14 years between the time that he got sold into slavery until he was brought out of the jail and elevated uh, to a position of leadership in Egypt. That's a long time. We read it in just a couple of chapters, and we think, well, 10, 15 minutes didn't take long. But that man spent years in that situation. His own family, those who were supposed to be as close to him as anyone else, they sold him out. They wanted to get rid of him. They were jealous of him. Later, years down the road, when time came and there was a famine all around and Egypt was the only one that had been smart enough because of Joseph's insight from the Lord to, to store up food and be prepared, it made the kingdom even more advanced than it was. His own brothers show up then. They don't recognize him. Finally, he reveals who he is, and they, sh they knew sure enough he was going to have him put to death. And you read in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, he says these words. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. You remember no matter what anybody does to you, God can use it for good to bless you. Never forget that. He tells us in verse 15, he says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. That's the, the ninth thing that we'll look at, being sympathetic. Uh, this is what love does, and it? it just is sympathetic. I mentioned last week, and, and which is not uncommon, it, it just sometimes we, when, we're, when we, we know what's right, we want to just say, here's what you need to do and be right. But sometimes we have to show mercy and compassion, even when it's difficult to do. We have to be sympathetic with struggles that people are going through with their life. If your brother is rejoicing, he says, rejoice with him. Share in his joy. Be glad with him. You know, praise the Lord together. You know, folks this morning says, we got a new car. They were excited about sharing it. I said, bless, bless you, God. You know, surely bless you. They want me to go pray for it, you know. And I said, well, I'll say a little prayer for the car. I mean, it's going to be good for them. It'll be taken care of, you know, right on down the line. Oh, I could say, well, I ain't got no new car. My car's got 150,000 miles on it. Or the one I'm getting ready to send my son back to school, it's got 315,000 miles on it. Why ain't I got a new car? You know, I could be, we could do that, can't we? We can just say, well, I've been blessed in so many ways, and when it's my time, God's going to give me his blessing. So I can rejoice and be blessing those who are sharing in joy. If your sister is weeping, weep with her. Share, share the sorrows of brokenness with someone. Do, during times of sorrow, it's hard to just keep your mouth shut. And, and, and you know, I've, I'm learning. I'm still not there. I'm still trying to learn. Sometimes I'm just supposed to just show up and not show out. You understand what I'm getting at? Sometimes I'm just supposed to sit there and be quiet and pray. That's all God wants me to do, and that's all the people sometimes. I don't have to have all the answers. You don't either. You know? And sometimes you, you just try to sit there with them, and when they start crying, maybe God says, cry with them. You know, they're hurting, and if, if they're hurting, you love them enough, they're part of your family. 
hurt with them and cry and mourn. That's what love does. And then he says in verse 16, as we get ready to close, live in harmony with one another. Don't be proud, uh, but be willing to associate with people of low position. And do not be conceited. And what he's telling us to do, just simply be humble. That's what we have to do. Be, be of the same mind toward one another. Live, living in harmony. You know, that, that means that everybody feels the same and treats one another the same. Uh, what way is that? Just simply with love. Now, we, we all have different ways of showing it, don't we? You know, uh, we, we, we teach classes on understanding relationships, and men and women are different, and we all have various love languages, you know, uh, you know and say, well, this person likes uh, a physical touch. They love you to hold their hand or need a hug once in a while, where others just say, hey, I thought about you today, and I know you collect coupons, and so I brought these coupons today, and, you know, I cut them out of my, my newspaper or my flyer or whatever. And for somebody says, oh, oh. Appreciate the coupons, you know. Somebody said, wow, thank you for thinking of me. It was just the act of going through the trouble to think about. And to them, it's a simple but yet heartfelt gift. It, it doesn't have to be. You just have to be thinking about how to be as humble as you possibly can, serving with one mind, thinking about how to love people. And, and sum it up this way. Just don't be a snob about whatever you're going through in life. Don't think better of yourself than anybody else. Because when it all comes down to it, you know what the Bible tells me? One day, we're all going to bow our knees before Jesus. And every one of us is going to have to confess that he is the Lord. Nobody's going to be immune to it. We're all going to be in that same situation where we're all going to stand before the, ju the judgment seat. And we're going to have to give an account for the things that we've done in this body, whether they be good or bad. That don't tell me I'm getting immune to it because I went to Bible college for so many years and I've preached in a pulpit for so many years or I've served in this capacity or I've done this. What it tells me is when we get there, regardless if it's the person that that day before the Lord decided to come and reap the harvest and take us all, that very day when he decided today's the day I'm accepting Jesus or if we've been in Christ for 60 or 80 years, we're all going to be in the same boat when we get there. And that's a very humbling experience, isn't it? When we have to think about it that way. Maybe sometimes people say, well, I don't like when the preacher says that he's got flaws. Well, I'm going to have to give an account for them. So I might as well confess them to you now. So I'm not have to give an account for that. You try to mislead these people. You, you, you try to pretend to be something you weren't in front of folks. If we're going to be the church, we have to take everybody's mess. Mine, yours, hers, his. And down the road, when we get there and we get to stand there united, holding hands around the judgment seat, you say, God, we came here together. And Lord, we're going to enter the kingdom together. We're going to celebrate eternity together. And this is why we're doing it. Because you placed us in this body. And we acted in love as best we could. And when we struggled and when we failed one another, we, we reached out and we, we asked for forgiveness and mercy. And that's all we can do today as we stand before you. We ask for your forgiveness and your mercy. And you know what he's going to say? Well done. Well done. Enter into your rest. I pray we're ready. Next week we'll continue. And we'll look at what acts in love really look like in the church. But today, where do you stand? And how are you following him? And what does he call you to? I'm going to pray for us right now, and then we're going to stand and sing. Father, we, we recognize, God, that we are part of your body. Lord, we pray that we're living up and we're healthy as we can be, and, and we can be as strong as you desire for us to be in this world. But we recognize sometimes we get a little weak. We've got ailments and aches and pains along the way. We need a checkup from here and there, and need a little medication, whatever it is. We pray, Lord, we're seeking your word to get all that. But today, Lord, we just pray that you remind us of your, how much you love us through Jesus. Uh, as we have this cross before us every week, week in and week out, we're reminded, not simply, as something that is a, 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 a beautiful, uh, ornate piece in the church building, but it was one of the most disgusting and cruel things that you could have to endure on our behalf. 
So today, God, we, we're submitting ourselves before that, recognizing that maybe uh, we need a little help along the way to be as healthy as we can as a church and as individual Christians. Let us never see it beyond what it was meant to be and, and, and act in love on your behalf toward us. And may everything that we do going forward as New Testament Christian Church or as a follower of Jesus individually, when people see a cross, that, Lord, they will see us serving you just in that, acting in love and serving you in a full capacity. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.